Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for 14th of October 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is once again Might and Magic Clash of Heroes. The BTF is forthcoming at some point over the weekend. And now you see why the Wadsworth constant is not required for Total Biscuit videos. First email comes in from Madeline that says, I couldn't fail to notice a slight contradiction in some things you keep saying. In one of your mailboxes, you pointed out that teenagers and students will be found more in free-to-play games than adults with credit cards, which is indeed the truth. On the other hand, you also pointed out that pirating should be a very concerning thing. Imagine this scenario. You did make Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine out as an extraordinary game with in-game footage both online and offline. Teenagers and students watched that and ached to play it, myself included. What do you think would happen if the parents of the underaged in question didn't want to spend $60 or whatever high price it costs? You and many others tried to convince them to play and succeeded while they were forced to watch videos on YouTube about this. The next stop for those is piracy, and I don't mean downloading something and selling it at half price, just playing for their own enjoyment, and in many cases even without multiplayer. Please clarify this chapter of opinion, because you seem to be, at the same time, supporting free-to-play teenagers, aka people who enjoy stuff with limits, and condemn piracy in all its forms. Well, yes, because one of those is legitimate and one isn't. It's really as simple as that. Just because they have the same net outcome doesn't mean that it's okay. The problem with piracy is that, more often than not, once people start doing it, it's kind of difficult to stop, and I'm not suggesting that it's addictive, I'm suggesting that the brain says this is the cheapest and easiest way for me to get access to what I want, and I am not paying a cent for it, so why should I go back to the legitimate way of things? When you get used to getting all of your games for free, it's pretty damn hard to then turn around, even if you do then have the money, and say, right, okay, I'm gonna have to pay $60 for this now, when I've been getting it for free for the last however many months, years even. So that's a bit of a problem right there. Yes, the net effect on the company is, without question, zero. There's no real doubt about that. Piracy and simply not buying it are effectively the same thing, in terms of money made at the point of sale. However, consider the following. If you have pirated a game and played it, the chances of you then buying it later exponentially decrease. Why? Because you have got what you wanted out of that game. You've got what you needed out of that game. And unless that game happens to be particularly exceptional on the multiplayer side of things, which I might point out Space Marine is certainly not, just as an example, for your example, then you're not going to buy that game, are you? And that is the problem, because when it comes down to selling games, it's not just about the first couple of weeks. If you have pirated and played a game to death, why would you then buy it when it goes down in price later on? Why would you even buy it on a sale? It depends how cheap it is. I mean, if it's a couple of pounds, yeah, maybe. But just because you want to pad out your Steam collection. Hey, look, I've got access to this game readily. But what happens if, say, a £30 game goes down to £15? which is quite the drop or if you look at the standard way that games tend to decrease in price over the normal brick and mortar retail model you'll tend to find that as a british example a game releases for pc for 30 to 35 pounds it'll then after a few months probably drop down to about 20 pounds it'll then end up in a 2 for 25 range 2 for 15 range then 3 for 10 range then it might end up on clearance then all in that time you could potentially have steam sales on that particular product and the people that pirated the game, for instance, Space Marine, are very unlikely to pick it up even at a reduced price. It would have to be a very, very reduced price to the point where, say, it barely makes anything for anyone, including Steam and the company. And if Space Marine was sold, say, three to four years away from now at £2, and somebody that pirated it then buys it, they really haven't exactly given value to the company, have they? And yet... Let's contrast that to somebody that simply does not buy the game at all and buys it at £2 later on. Now, is that the same thing? Net worth-wise, yes, it is. But here's the thing. The probability of the guy that pirated it buying before that point was significantly lower than the guy that couldn't afford it at the time. That guy is perhaps more likely to notice it on either a Steam sale, maybe a little bit later for 50% off, or see it in a shop for two for 25, or maybe just 15 pounds, or maybe pick up a copy somewhere else that's got a discount on it one way or the other. A little bit later down the line, because they happened to have some money at the time, they didn't have enough money for it on launch, and the guy that pirated it, well, he's just not even going to bother until it gets down to such a low price point that it's not making any real money for anyone, as I pointed out before. That's the problem with discussing piracy, isn't it? It varies on a person-to-person -person basis. You can always make the argument, well, I wasn't going to buy it anyway, but in reality, that changes on a person-by-person -person basis. Some people would purchase it at a certain price point, some people would purchase it at another price point, some people may impulse buy it because they happen to have some money that they weren't expecting at the time, say, 
say, a relative gives them money, or they get, say, money for their birthday or Christmas present or something like that, or they just happen to find £10 on the damn street. It's so, so variable on a person-to-person -person basis. But what you can say consistently and every single time is that someone that pirated it and played it and perhaps finished it on day one is way, way less likely to purchase it later on at a lower price point than somebody that didn't do that, missed out on it because he didn't have the money to get it. That you cannot dispute. There is no real doubt about that. And it doesn't matter that it varies on a person-to-person -person basis. That is simple logic. And when it comes to something a little bit less logical, just consider perhaps the moral implications of taking something that you are not entitled to. That makes you a bit of a dick. If you're looking for excuses for piracy, then I think at the back of your mind, you already know, you already know that it was wrong to begin with. A free-to-play business model except that some people, in fact perhaps the majority of people, will not pay for that game. That is the risk that the company takes when they adopt that business model because they believe in the long run that it is more lucrative and makes more sense for their particular title. A full-priced game does not adopt that business model, and while it should assume that some people also pirate it, that does not mean you are entitled to do it. This email comes in from Greedy that says, It's been recently announced that Batman Arkham City will require a first purchaser code to access the Catwoman missions, which are single-player content. Recently, there has been a trend for games to acquire an online pass to access multiplayer content, which come with a new game, but can be bought usually for around £8. However, this is the first I know of a game locking out single-player content without a pass. Well, I know of another game that did that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Personally, I think this is a blatant attack on the second-hand market. The passes for multiplayer content are bad enough with one of the most common excuses being that money is required to keep servers running, etc., which I see as a flawed argument, as a second-hand game does not increase the number of people playing the game, just who is playing it. This seems to be blatant profiteering, and now I believe that this could have been one of the main reasons the developer included the Catwoman content in Arkham Asylum, although that could just be me being cynical. Anyway, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the issue. I understand that devs want to make money from the second-hand market, but I think this could be done in ethically better ways, for example, releasing high-quality DLC. Well, Batman's definitely not the first game to have done that. The first one that I can think of is actually Rage quite recently with the fact that the sewers are locked down if you buy a second-hand copy. Now, I do see this as being a little bit less justifiable than the multiplayer thing. I mean, yes, you can argue that it's the same number of people playing, but on the flip side, I would like to argue that the copy is being used more than it perhaps otherwise would be. You've got the idea that a game has a certain shelf life, it then goes on the shelf and you're not playing the multiplayer anymore. If it's a second-hand copy, then that game could be constantly in use on the multiplayer side of things for years and years, whereas otherwise it would not be. But I will also admit that that is a fairly weak-ass argument, and your point is, for the most part, valid. When it comes to locking down single-player content, it is unfortunate, I feel, that developers and publishers have had to go to this length in order to stamp on the second-hand market, because... Unfortunately, brick-and-mortar stores have made it impossible for the developers and publishers to make any money from the second-hand market, while companies like GameStop, Game, GameStation, and now even supermarkets like Asda and Walmart are able to make ludicrous margins, absolutely ludicrous margins, without having to pay a single penny to any of the developers or publishers from simply selling secondhand games. The problem with secondhand games is that a secondhand game, unless of course it's a collector's edition or a limited edition with some kind of physical item that can actually have wear and tear on it, is identical in every way to a new copy. Even if the CD is scratched, it's incredibly easy to get a CD resurfaced these days and it'll be as good as new. It's a digital copy, it works the same as a copy that was bought brand new, shrink-wrapped off the shelf that day. And that's the biggest, biggest problem. Because selling a physical good second-hand, you don't generally expect that physical good to be exactly the same quality as a new one, which is why you are willing to pay less for it. When it comes to games, you pay less for a product that is exactly the same. And I don't think it should be exactly the same. And this is why this whole multiplayer pass thing has come in. I personally do not disagree with the multiplayer pass thing. I think it is a necessary evil simply because you've got those big box retailers that refuse to play ball. They absolutely 110% refuse to cooperate on the matter. And unfortunately, there's really not an awful lot that devs and publishers can actually do about it. 
Now, it's getting to the point where disc-based gaming is probably dead within the next 20 years, if not before that. So the second-hand market is on a limited time frame. It will die out eventually. You will not be able to get a second-hand game anymore. All games will be digital. All games will be key-based. They will be locked to a specific person. I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing ever. The second-hand market certainly has its uses, for instance, to get hold of games that are not available anymore. Although, once again, that's pretty much sorted out with the digital distribution system because games don't take up shelf space anymore. They can be online for as long as you damn well please. The reason why games become hard to find is because they stop manufacturing the damn things and, of course, shops have limited shelf space and stop stocking it. That is irrelevant with something like, say, Steam or Gamers Gate or Direct to Drive or even Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network. The games can be up there for an infinite amount of time. They are all, always available to be purchased. I would agree that creating high-quality DLC is a good way to monetize your game afterwards and, of course, get something out of the people that decided to buy the game secondhand. I, I'm definitely, 110%. I absolutely agree with that. That is a good idea. And honestly, companies should be creating high-quality DLC anyway. The thing they want to do is to increase buyer confidence to the point where buying DLC won't be such a goddamn potluck Russian roulette anymore. At this point, buying a DLC pack, God knows what it could contain. God knows if it's good value for money. And of course, no refunds on that kind of thing. I think Batman Arkham City and, of course, to a lesser extent, Rage are stretching how acceptable this is. I mean, for instance, with Rage, you've got something, you know, the sewers, where really a lot of people don't even notice them in the game. And that's true, you know, they're not actually a major part of the game. So locking those out isn't really such a big deal. Catwoman, that is a big deal. That, that's a massive deal. That's all over the trailers. That's a huge part of Arkham City is the fact that you can play as Catwoman. That's a huge deal. So locking that down, yes, I think is on the borderline of what's acceptable. It's just really unfortunate that companies have had to resort to this. I totally understand why they've had to do it. And it pisses me off because everybody loses. You know, the consumers lose, the devs and the publishers lose, the only people that don't lose were the guys that caused this to happen in the first place, who are people like Game, GameStop, and GameStation. For God's sake, please stop buying from these people. They are the reason that this is happening. They are the reason. If it was just a couple of copies on eBay, do you think devs and publishers would really give a damn? No. Do you think devs and publishers give a damn about you lending a game to a friend? No, they don't care about that kind of stuff. They understand that that is completely normal. The problem is there is a massive second-hand market, huge. You've got a lot of stores where there's more used copies of games than there are new. In fact, that's incredibly common. It's a massive issue. It's a massive problem. And now here we are. Doesn't it suck? I don't even know which side to go on because I understand the arguments of both. It it's a situation that goddamn sucks and i hate that it's even come to this point i really do this one comes in from moose that says recently i've seen that many players are building and ordering brand new pc systems specifically around the ability to play battlefield 3 at the highest possible settings now, i admit that i am myself in the process of building an 800 pound system purely so games like battlefield 3 and skyrim can be enjoyed at the highest quality this is as i'm sure you know what also happened when crisis came out and set a new graphical benchmark my question to you is it really in the long run worth it when I know that in two to three years my system will quite possibly be completely out of date and need a complete overhaul? Whereas consoles are able to go for five to ten years without no problems, as games that come out on consoles are specifically tailored to run on the console they're meant for. PC gaming is very good, but is the constant battle for the very best graphics and FPS really worth the strain on your bank account? Well, that's it, isn't it? That's the big, big problem that's facing PC gaming. It's been facing PC gaming for quite some time. The problem is that a PC can be purely a games machine for you in the fact that you don't need the power for anything else. And as a result, you have a very expensive games machine in comparison to a console. I absolutely understand that. I and mean, for me, it's different because my PC is used for work. I couldn't use a console for this. I need a powerful machine to do my job. But for most people, that really isn't the case. You don't need a powerful machine to use a word processor, to look at a website, to type an email. You can do it on a netbook. You can do it on a phone. That's the question you have to ask yourself, isn't it? You know that it will be out of date. I mean, f let's be honest. The console lifespan this time around has been extremely long. I mean, way longer than what we're used to, honestly. We're expected to see a new console maybe every three to four years. We don't expect consoles to last for seven. 
And this has been a really, really long gap in the generations. I don't blame anyone for thinking very, very hard about spending that kind of money. PC gaming can be very, very expensive indeed. That said, I would argue that you can make up that amount of money over the course of a number of years thanks to the fact that games are cheaper. And PC games are cheaper than console games, even on launch. And with, for instance, Steam and Gamersgate and Direct to Drive, you've got a lot of fairly ridiculous sales. Not to mention, of course, how cheap it is to purchase indie titles. Now, of course, you could do the same thing with Xbox Live Arcade as well, so let's not discount that. But there are a lot more indie titles on PC digital-based distribution platforms than there are on Xbox Live Arcade. There's nothing I can really say to you as a person that says this is worth it. You know you will get a superior experience, but how superior an experience? I like to compare it to people that have Blu-ray players and yet still buy DVDs because they don't think the quality difference between the two mediums is actually worth the money. I don't really blame them on that, honestly. I find myself buying DVD box sets of TV series because Blu-ray box sets cost so much more and actually offer a fairly negligible difference from a distance. You know, if I was sitting there with my laptop and staring at it from, say, a foot away, yeah, definitely, 110% can tell the difference. Watching it on my TV, which of course has technology to clean things like that up and upscale and things like that, from a distance, the difference probably isn't worth the extra cost. You get very much diminishing returns in that regard. And when it comes to PC gaming, yes, you can also have diminishing returns because, yeah, a PC is going to look much better. But how much better? £800 PC versus £100 console. Both play Battlefield 3. One looks better. Does one look eight times better? No. No, it doesn't. It does not look eight times better. And yet they both play the same game and one costs a lot of money. Well, that's it really, isn't it? You gotta decide for yourself. You really, really do. It's the difference between driving a Kia and driving a Mercedes. Hell, when it comes to price differentiation, you might as well say it's the difference between driving a Kia and driving a damn Bentley. They both get you from point A to point B, but damn does one do it better than the other. That said, they both get you from point A to point B. Personal decisions, folks. Personal decisions. All right, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox, and that is indeed me done for the week. I shall see you on Monday with yet more mailboxy action and goodness. Email mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. I'll see you next time.